Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I come to you every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM, or you can stream me online at www.960am, uh, saga960am.ca. Um, what to do with the death penalty is a, uh, is a big issue, and, uh, and there's a couple of uh, controversial uh, um, death penalty um, uh, cases going on right now. And uh, uh, I wanted to find out more about this, and so we're joined tonight by uh, um, Abraham Bonowitz, is that correct? Yes. Who is the director of Death Penalty Action. And uh, Abraham, tell us what's going on and what the issue is and why you're so focused on it. Uh, well, so um, thanks for having me, first of all, and, and greetings, everyone. Um, so it's been a little bit over a year in the making now, but for just, just about a month ago in, in July, um, they announced federal execution dates for the first time in 17 years. The, the United States federal government, as opposed to our state governments, the federal government has its own death penalty and they had not executed anybody since when George W. Bush was president. So of course, under the Obama administration, there were no federal executions. And then uh, Donald Trump became president and we knew it was only a matter of time. And, and we were actually all very surprised when it took 27 months for them to announce federal execution dates. Uh, but then we started figuring out the calendar and seeing that you know, it's coming up on re-election time. <laughs> Excuse me. And, um, and what's, uh, what we see happening, and I'll be happy to get into this in more detail, but the nutshell is, it's not about justice, it's not about the victims, it's not about anything other than setting up a political talking point for the president to be able to say he's the most executing president since the 1950s and uh, he's the law and order president and he can then challenge his opponent in the election to say, you gotta tell me why you wouldn't execute this terrible criminal. And now I've executed, well, so far three, but there's two more scheduled on the Wednesday and Friday going into the weekend of the Republican National Convention. What, so you're saying this is all politically motivated? That's disgusting. Well, it is disgusting. And, and the evidence is now there because after the very first execution uh, it, it, on July 7th, well, it happened on uh, uh, July 14th. So they scheduled three in one week, July 13th, 15th, and 17th. Um, and, and what's extra disgusting about it is that there were still appeals left uh, to argue in each of those cases for different reasons. And uh, the first one, you know, we got to, he was supposed to be executed at 4 p.m. His name is Daniel Lee. And in his case, the victim's families opposed the execution. And they had argued that, you know, we oppose it. They asked the president, and they said, we voted for you. We don't want this execution to happen. And please commute this guy's sentence so that we don't have to endure this as the victim family. Um, and, and plus that particular case, there was an actual killer and an, an accomplice. The actual killer got uh, a life sentence and the accomplice got the death sentence. And they thought that was unfair. Uh, so in any case, appeals got in the way. We got all the way to midnight and a number of us were, you know, standing around just refreshing our computers and our phones and waiting for the U.S. Supreme Court to issue its ruling as to whether they would uphold the stay that was currently there. Uh, we got to midnight, we figured, okay, this date is over. They'll have to reset a new date. We went home, uh, back to our hotel rooms or whatever. Journalists were with us and they also went home. One drove like 50 miles back to Bloomington from Terre Haute, Indiana, which is where this all happens. And then at two o'clock in the morning, the US Supreme Court overturned the stay and the Bureau of Prisons just said, okay, we have to give you a new date. We're giving you one, it's in two hours. <laughs> and they, put him on the gurney and he was on the gurney for over four hours while they continued their legal shenanigans. His attorneys were even were not even aware that he had been given a new date until they saw that he'd been executed in a tweet. So that's the kind of 
you know, push, push, push that's happening. And, and you know how Donald Trump is, uh, he, you know, you get fired if you don't do what he wants. And, you know, so you have an attorney general and a head of the Bureau of Prisons, and they're just doing whatever it takes. The next guy they executed, well, backing up, what I wanted to make sure to say is that once they executed Daniel Lee, they ended up executing him after four hours on the execution table, 16 hours after he was supposed to be executed, within a, an hour or two there was an email to the Trump campaign saying, we've executed this horrible cr criminal and Joe Biden needs to say why he would not kill him. You know, so it's politically it's, motivated and fundraising oriented, et cetera. Yeah, all Unbe of that. Un unbelievable. Um, Abraham uh, Barnowitz, is that correct? Barnowitz, yes. Barnowitz, I apologize. Um, thanks for uh, bringing this to our attention. We're gonna take a break and come back more with uh, the director of, uh, of, of uh, Death penalty yeah. action? Yes. In just a minute. Stay with us. Well, I'm not sure if I should welcome you back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour tonight or not, uh, because this is uh, a terrible story, uh, but it's a story that needs to be heard. Uh, I'm chatting tonight with uh, Abraham Bonowitz, who is the director of uh, Death Penalty Action, an organization in the United States against the death penalty. Um, and he's telling us that uh, there haven't been any death penalties um, federally in the United States uh, since George W. Bush, uh, none during the Obama administration, none during the first, uh, I guess, three years of the Trump administration, three and a half years. Uh, but just coming up to uh, election time, um, there are several that have happened and are going to happen coming up just ahead of the Republican National Convention, Abraham is saying. Uh, so yes. welcome back to the show. And, uh, and you've uh, just told us one terrible story. And, and just to follow up on it for a second, if I could, why would the accomplice get the death penalty and the actual murderer get life sentence? What's the difference? Well, you know, I, I would encourage people to just Google Daniel Lee and, and look at, because uh, I'm not going to be able to tell you exactly what happened. But I will say that often the first person to turn state's evidence, so the police say, hey, you testify against the other guy and you'll get a lesser sentence. And that's, uh, I, I can't say for sure, I should know this, but uh, as to that's, that's likely what happened in that case. It's often what happens um, in many states. And, and in this case, we have, uh, they have different names for it. In Texas, they call it the law of parties. So you, know, you could be the getaway driver and never even have been present when the execution was, when a murder was happening, but you're part of the crime being committed, you're an accomplice and you're just as culpable as the person who pulled the trigger. And that's one of the, one of the con <laughs> concerns, because a lot of people, you know, they, they went in to rob the store, they wanted some money, but they weren't planning to kill anybody. And that's all, that's how actually, you know, most murders are crimes of passion. They weren't really planned. Uh, and they just, they ended up happening, but they, they weren't a, um, you know, going and I'm gonna kill you kind of thing. So in any case, that, that's, that's the type of thing that's supposed to be the worst of the worst. Uh, so, so, so what I, happened in this case was- Not quite sure. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about some of the other cases that are happening, uh, have happened or are happening. Well, we had two more executions in the middle, in the middle of July. Um, the second one was a man named uh, Perky who had Alzheimer's disease and, uh, de and dementia. And, you know, I happen to, you know, my dad died of Alzheimer's disease. I have a good sense of what it is once you get down that path. Um, constantly ask, answering the same question over and over again. They don't know what's happening. Um, he gave a fairly lucid sounding um, last statement, but you know, it was, you know, somebody suggested that that had been scripted. Either way, he's been diagnosed. And even the day before that execution, suddenly the defense found that the the state had, the government had a brain scan showing his deterioration of his brain. And still, you know, part of the law in the United States is you have to understand what's happening to you. And Mr. Perky thought he was being executed because, and he wasn't even quite sure what execution was, but he thought it was because, you know, people didn't like him in the prison and, and things like that. And, the, you know, again, the details are 
less of a concern to me than the fact that we have a government that has the power to execute, and especially that we have a president who can use that power with the timing scripted to simply give him a credential that he can use to get himself reelected, or at least to get um, you know, kudos from within his, uh, his, his uh, political supporters. Unbelievable. And, and so these are people that uh, you know, have gone through a trial, have uh, been found guilty, mm -hmm. have served uh, time in uh, prison, um, and, uh, and I presume have uh, had the death penalty uh, a charge um, and, and then um, you know, appealed it if uh, the appeal was available, and all those have run out. But you're saying in the end it's up to the president whether they actually get executed well, or not? Yes, there's always executive clemency, both at the state level and um, and at the federal level. So what happens is when you get your death warrant, then your attorneys will make a clemency, a case for clemency. They'll pre present a petition to the, the pardon attorney who, you know, that's how it works in the federal system. Uh, at the state level, there's often a, a board of pardons and paroles that looks at it and makes a recommendation to the governor in this case, it would be a recommendation to the president. And he or she gets, uh, you know, it's their job to decide whether mercy may be um, uh, warranted and whether or not they want to give that. So in this case, it's the president. In, in the case of federal executions, it's the president. He doesn't set the execution dates specifically, but he decides whether or not to grant clemency to show mercy, which he and, has and the for power the first to do. For the first three and a half years, did he grant clemency or there just weren't cases? Uh, he, he had had a number, not in, not in capital cases, but in other cases. Uh, a very famous one was a, a woman that was in, in prison for a spousal murder. She'd been abused and all that sort of thing. And you get, um, and, and which was an issue, you know, as to how we treat people that, that you know, kill in, in self-defense and then end up putting them in jail anyway. But um, you get Kim Kardashian walking in, and, and this is to her credit, not to, not to at all to diminish her, but she has taken up a number of these cases, of cases of wrongful conviction or unfairness. Anyway, she was able to get an appointment with the president and go see him using her celebrity status and walked a person out of prison. And the, and the president granted that. So, you know, the joke is- Sorry, the, not only um, was able to get uh, clemency granted, but walked them out of prison too? Uh, well, yeah, she was able to see that person walk out. I mean, I don't know if she was there physically when that happened, but point is she was able to- So a complete pardon of the whole sentence, not just the-, the It, it was the a sentence. commutation of sentence, I believe, again, the specifics, I'd have to double check, but the point is that uh, somebody used their celebrity status, and not just that case. The president has granted you know, a couple dozen clemencies so far in lesser cases, not people off the death row. Uh, and, and, and usually, you know, we're not talking about murder kind of crimes. But the point is that he's used it. And, uh, and it, you always get to make a political point no matter what you do. But here we're, instead of using the power of the pardon, the power of clemency in cases where there's a clear, you know, when you have the victim family begging, please don't kill this guy. And when you have a person who is suffering from dementia, uh, you know, we don't need to kill these people in order to be saved from them or hold them accountable for what they did. Okay, and, and so far, there's not been a contest about whether or not they were involved in the crime, but there are people on the federal death row. Bill Allen is a, is a person like that who has a strong claim of innocence. Now he doesn't have an execution date yet, but, um, but we often have people executed. Well, you know, Daniel Lee, that first man that the president executed, you know, he said on his execution, uh, his last statement was, you're, you're killing an innocent person. Um, Again, I think that alludes to he wasn't actually the person who did the killing. Um, again, details are less than the fact that the death penalty is being used. Executions are happening on a timetable that is scripted by the re-election campaign of the President of the United States. You know, if, 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 do, if do, he, do people know about this? 
Well, this is a difficult time to reach people with this message, which is why I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to speak with you, even though we're in Canada. Uh, you know, it's still important that people are hearing this message and understand what's happening. Uh, but we're also, I'm talking to any, anybody that will have, uh, have me, I'm getting on to programs like this and, and talking in the news and, and um, I guess the problem is really, with uh, COVID-19 and race riots and, and the comeback of the NBA and sports and everyone's well, going crazy. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to get above all the other media stuff going on, but this is an issue. And if you're right, that it is being predicated by the reelection committee and, and uh, campaign issues, it's just, it's astounding, but it shouldn't be surprising because this president, you know, will do whatever he wants to do. And it's like, uh, you know, throwing things at the wall, see what sticks. Uh, but he, does, he, he has realized now that he is not going to be held accountable for whatever he does. <clears throat> That's in violation of the law or ethics. Um, so he's going for it across the board. And this is just one more way. You know, he's always styled himself as the law and order president. And this is a credential that he, you know, he's had this fascination with the death penalty for a very long time. Has he really? I have not heard that. So, you, uh, has, so he's been it, a proponent for it? Uh, have you past? seen the film or heard about the film When They See Us about the Central Park Five? Yes. So for those who haven't heard about that film, it's about a real case that happened uh, in the 1980s, I believe, that you know, there was a, a group of kids just carousing in, in the park and got scooped up after somebody turned up raped and almost killed. And the police were able to you know, browbeat the kids into testifying against each other, some of whom didn't even know each other. In any case, when that happened, Donald Trump took out a full page ad in the New York Times saying, bring back the death penalty and talking about how it's important to be executing people so we could take care of these, these, this crime that's happening in the streets. So as far back as then, death penalty, death penalty, death penalty. There's been a few times um, since he became president that he's you know, called for more executions, for example, for people who killed police officers and that sort of thing. Um, so he's had this fascination with it. And okay, and, and yet you say this is politically motivated, so there must be a lot of other people within, I presume, his base that uh, also are fascinated by it. Uh, what what uh, the polls well, perhaps, show? Perhaps, I mean, there's, there's, there's death porn, one thing, but then there's also using it to stoke up people. Because there's also a lot of people in his Sorry, face. Sorry, I apologize, excuse me. Did you say death porn? That's what I said, yes. People that are fascinated with death such that they get, you know, they watch films and whatever. I mean, <laughs> sorry, I didn't Seriously? mean to sidetrack you. Oh my God, that's disgusting. Well, it is, it is. But you know, it's what you have is, is I mean, there, is, there are people that are fascinated by these things and, and that's real. So in any case, how Donald Trump's motivation comes, I think is separate and, and whether he's fascinated or really gung-ho about the death penalty really is separate from the fact that somebody, whether it was Donald Trump or somebody in his campaign staff basically said, we're gonna hold on to executions until it's the run up to the election. And then, and, and then, and then and execute the out. execution. And, and, and so tell go. me if, tell me if you could, are there polls either within the population generally or within the Republican party as to what uh, percentage of the population support uh, the death penalty? Uh, yes, there are. There are regular okay. polls that happen on different levels and you can look at the best place to find a bunch of them and see and compare them is on the webpage of the group called Death Penalty, the Death Penalty Information Center. That's deathpenaltyinfo.org, Death Penalty Information Center. And you can just look at polling and see what's the latest. But the most recent poll shows that uh, the, a surprising dip in, well, rather a surprising jump in the number of people who believe that the death penalty is immoral in the United States. It's approaching 50%. Uh, the real question to be asking with polling, uh, and Gallup does this, it seems, they, they usually ask, the, the Gallup polling um, agency usually asks about the death penalty every fall. And uh, it seems like every other year they ask the question, would you prefer life without the possibility of parole, which I like to call death in prison or death by incarceration, would you prefer that to the death penalty? And 
the numbers are consistently rising and that more people support the alternative punishment of life without parole than do the death penalty every time that question is asked. Okay, and, and you can see that. So what we, the other thing that's really jumping is the number of conservatives and Republicans, self-styled conservatives and Republicans who now oppose the death penalty. That number grows every year. And, and that's because people see that it doesn't work. It's a bad public policy. It costs us a lot more than it does to throw away the key if that's what we want to do. Um, and certainly it's not up to what we, what I would say is the, the, the ideal bedrock foundation of uh, the, the legal system in, in the United States, which is the four words carved into the face of the United States Supreme Court building. Those four words are equal justice under law. And anybody that's had any connection to a legal system, probably anywhere, knows that what matters more than the severity of the crime is race and money and the politics of geography. Um, you know, you got to kill, the, and that's how you can really see the disparity of the death penalty in the United States. It's not the states that have it, which, it, by the way, are also becoming less and less, fewer and fewer. It's not the states that have it, it's what counties have it, because that's how you really can measure, because in order to get a death sentence, and this, by the way, is why I changed my mind about the death penalty. I used to support it, uh, but I learned you have to kill in a county with enough money to prosecute a death penalty case, even to be able to face a death penalty. And what that means where I live in Franklin County, which is Columbus, Ohio, uh, if I can go to the next county south or two counties south, or two counties north and be in a much more rural area where they don't have the tax base, they can't even afford a death, they can't even afford a death penalty trial, even if they want it. And that makes the whole thing suspect as to how do we have a fair system. It's not fair if it's uh, justice is so different in so many different uh, places. Exactly, exactly. So it's a handful of counties that are carrying out executions out of more than 3,000 counties in this country. Really only uh, a couple of dozen have any real use of the death penalty and the numbers that are actually carrying out executions each year now are fewer and fewer. I mean, this year is an anomaly by, uh, with COVID and everything, but we've been in the 20s. Uh, uh, the, the number of, an of executions annually in this country with usually more than half of those happening in the state of Texas. But even that, the state half of Texas. Half in the state of Texas. Typically, yes. Unbelievable. We're going to take another break um, for messages. Uh, this is a soaring um, and, and just... I can't believe it conversation that we're having tonight about the death penalty in the United States um, and uh, and Abraham's uh, contention, Abraham Bonowitz, is that correct? Yes. Um, I apologize for keep asking you. Abraham Bonowitz's right, uh, uh, con contention that it's being politically motivated. Stay with us. Uh, back in just a minute. Well, we're chatting tonight with Abraham um, Bonowitz, who is the director of, uh, of uh, death penalty action at a group in the United States that is opposed to the death penalty. Um, and uh, he's contending that, uh, that, uh, we, um, that we're uh, encountering some uh, executions in the United States for politically motivated reasons, uh, that Donald Trump wants to be seen as the law and order president, um, and that uh, while we haven't had uh, any executions in the United States since uh, Yes, not federal um, uh, executions in the United States since uh, uh, the George W. Bush um, um, presidency. Obama um, commuted them all. Um, no, he didn't commute them. He just didn't do anything. Yeah. Oh, he didn't do anything. Oh, okay, I apologize. He, he said, don't bring me any cases is what he did. Okay. Um, and so what happened to those people? They just stayed on death row? Yeah. Yep, that's what that's what happened, and and um, and the cases moved through the process. That was one of the things that, that happened was uh, because there were no executions during the Obama administration, people got to the end of their appeals, and then they just hung out. At the time that Donald Trump was uh, in, was inaugurated, I'm told there were about 11 people that had completely exhausted their appeals, and and again, the president waited 27 months 
before he had the attorney general set those dates. And then it took another year almost for them to actually be able to carry out uh, their first three executions. But they did three in one week, uh, circumventing legal, normal legal procedure and uh, in, in several of those cases. And, um, and now they've got two more coming up heading into the Republican National Convention. So there's no question in my mind that these are scripted. Uh, it's not about justice. It's not about the victims. It's about setting a moment, setting up a moment during the political campaign where Donald Trump can say, I'm tough on crime. I've executed people. You Democrats are weak. Your platform calls for ending the death penalty. And you need to explain why you wouldn't execute this killer. You know, so that's, that's what's being set up. Just watch, we'll see it. And, uh, and hopefully they'll decide that, you know, four or five is enough. Uh, actually, they've got a total of four more scheduled. Uh, August 26th, August 28th, and then I think it's September 22 uh, and 24 or 24 and 26, something like that. At the end of September, there's two more. And there are other people who anticipate having dates set as well. So we'll see where it goes. But, you know, it's not just the federal government, it's also the states. And that's an important thing to keep in mind is that fewer and fewer states are using the death penalty. And we've now actually legislatively abolished the death penalty in New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, Nebraska, uh, uh, New Hampshire, Colorado have all ab abolished the death penalty uh, 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 legislatively through passing a bill and having the bill signed. Now in Nebraska, you know, the, the governor there vetoed the bill. They overrode the veto. More Demo more Republicans voted to abolish the death penalty in Nebraska than, than there were Democrats even to vote for it. Um, so it's a not a partisan thing. And then the governor in Nebraska put his own money into a campaign to put it on the ballot and, and report and repeal it through a referendum. So Nebraska turned around and then they executed the guy who'd been on death row for almost 40 years. Uh, but then you also have states like uh, uh, Oregon and Pennsylvania and uh, California, where the governors have said there will be no executions on, under my watch and they've created a moratorium on executions. So, so, you know, there's 195 countries in the world. Yeah. And of that 195 countries, um, 55 have the death penalty. 105 have abolished it, and yes. uh, and um, eight um, have abolished it in practice, and 28 have effectively abolished in practice for the the vast majority of people. Yes. Um, in the Americas, North and Central and South America, there's only one country that has the death penalty. That's the United States. Yeah. In Europe, there's right. only one country that has the death penalty, and that's Belarus. The only other countries that have the death penalty are primarily Asia, China, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, Egypt, etc. So the United States is identifying itself with the countries that I just mentioned, and is yes. not identifying itself with any other country in the Americas or any country in Europe except Belarus. Can you explain that to me? Hey, we're a bit backwards and we're also a relatively new country. Um, I don't think there's any real excuse except that we're at a place, I think we're at a place where we're actually ready. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, yeah, they're, all, they're all Anglo-Saxon, you know, former British uh, um, countries that have all abolished their yes. nation. The, you know, the interesting thing is that when I started doing this work in the 1990s, the numbers were reversed. It was more countries had and used the death penalty than didn't. And now it's it's the way you described it. Um, I imagine you're looking at numbers from Amnesty International or the UN or someone like that. The At the end of the day, what we have, uh, there are people I work with who maintain that we have the death penalty because of Christians and because of politicians who are endeared to Christians, and and I'm not. So you're saying, saying Christians are the people that want to kill people. Some, 
some Christians. And it's because we have evangelical Christians and, 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 and legislators from uh, very, uh, you know, with a lot of evangelical Christian backing that you know, that's why they think they have to have the death penalty for their constituents, or maybe that's what they personally believe. Now, that's not me saying it. I have colleagues that I work with, Bill Pelkey, a murder victim family member who supported the death penalty when his, uh, when his grandmother was murdered by four teenage girls, and he initially supported it, and then decided that he needed to work against it because of, he came to a different way of looking at the teachings of his Christianity. Um, so, but that, but here's, here's the one that I'll say, it's because of Christians or Shane Claiborne, who's a founder of a group called Red Letter Christians. Uh, so for some Bibles, the, the words of Jesus are in red letters. And so they, they adhere to the actual words of Jesus and they work with us to, uh, in partnership to end the death penalty and to protest at executions and that sort of thing. So that's a big part of it. Another part of it is it's really, you know, it takes a lot to get people to give away something that they think uh, is a useful tool or that they're just, you know, this is all the way it's always been. So why do we need to do something different? Uh, I can tell you, having been a part of those campaigns where we've ended the death penalty in a number of states, New Jersey, New Mexico, Illinois, Connecticut, Maryland, uh, New Hampshire, Colorado, it, it didn't just happen. It was a conversation that happened over years where people got to see that not only are, is it a bad public policy because uh, it, it treats people differently and unfairly and wastes a lot of money, it, it also risks executing the wrong people and it creates greater pain for murder victim families. And it also sets up this divide among murder victim family members because we only seek the death penalty in a small percentage of cases. And if when they say, this is for the victim families, but we use it so infrequently. What we're really saying to the vast majority of murder victim family members is your loved one wasn't valuable enough. Now I turn that on its head to also say that when, if your loved one, God forbid, is murdered and they catch the person who did it and they don't seek a death sentence or they don't get a death sentence, once they're convicted and sentenced to prison and sent away, you can begin your healing process. But if they sentence the person to death, it might be 10 or 20 or 30 years before we get around to executing the person and you've had your healing process put on hold. And that's been one of the most, uh, the greatest motivators that I have. For so, this work. so interesting enough, in January this year, there mm -hmm. were 2,620 people that were death row inmates in the United States. And the average length of time that they've stayed in jail prior to then, prior to being executed is 15 years. That's the average. So a whole bunch have been in there longer than that. Uh, you know, I'm done, I've done a lot of work in Ohio, uh, which is where I live right now. And, and, and the last person we executed in this state was on death row for 35 years before we got around to executing him. And before Governor DeWine, uh, our current governor, basically stopped carrying out executions um, because he says uh, there's a problem with the method of execution here in Ohio and he's not gonna fix it, um, <laughs> which is interesting. But we, you know, we had tw he sat down at his desk when he took office uh, with 24 scheduled executions. And of those 24 executions, five would have been there from the time of their conviction to the time of their execution between 15 and 24 years, or between, between 15 and 20 years, uh, 12 between 20 and 30 years, and eight between 30 and 40 years, more than 30 years. Okay, and, and that's when we tell a victim family member, wait until we kill the guy and then you can begin your healing process, you know, that's damaging to them and it's unfair. And, and then again, when we say that the vast majority, more than 90, more almost, I would say almost 98% of murder victim family members where the death, where they catch your perpetrator and the death penalty is even possible most of the time, more than 90% for sure, they don't even, they don't get a death sentence. Okay, and that's a blessing in disguise for those people because they can begin to move on. So, are there know, um, statistics on race um, in regards oh, to death yes. penalties? <laughs> and in what fact, we just there was just a, um, 
Uh, the New York Times had a story about this about two weeks ago, um, illustrated incidentally uh, by a, a picture of an event that I ran, but this is really done by researchers from Harvard University. Um, and, and they found that you were 17 times more likely to get a death sentence if uh, your victim was a white person. That's where the real racism in the death penalty is, is not so much the race, not as much the race of the person who's accused, but in the race of the victim. If your victim is a white person, particularly a white female, you're much more likely to face a death sentence than if it's any other combination. So yeah, there is so much, Brian, I know we're gonna be limited on time, uh, that if people really wanna know the, more deeply about this, the best place for the statistics and the facts and figures is the Death Penalty Information Center, deathpenaltyinfo.org. That's not my organization. Uh, mine is Death Penalty Action. We're the place to go if you want to do something about it. And, I, and, and people, even from Canada or anywhere in the world, can sign our petitions and that sort of thing. But really what would make a huge difference is if people wanted to contribute funds to help us do the work. Uh, our webpage is deathpenaltyaction.org. But we also, especially with these federal executions, are encouraging people to send a letter. Just get out a piece of paper and an envelope and a stamp, if you remember what that is, and, and send a note to the U.S. Embassy in Canada. And I'm sure you can find the address on the internet and just say, hey, we don't think you need to be killing people. We oppose the death penalty. We're watching what you're up to. It disgusts us, Whatever, however you want to put it. You know, if it's your faith, if it's your politics, however you want to put it, write a note to the embassy or the consulate or whoever's near, nearby you and just, you know, let them be aware. Because I got to tell you, I know a lot of people that work in the State Department and they're really embarrassed by our current government, not just this one, but previous governments too, by how we, you know, we claim to be this bastion of human rights and how we treat our own people on so many different ways. You know, and our organization is also talking about these police killings, extra, extra judicial executions of people by police in the streets who decide to become the judge, jury, and executioner on unarmed people. That's the death penalty too. We're working on that, we oppose that. Um, mass incarceration gets to be looked at. We don't need it to be the way it is. And the way to start changing things is talking about it. And what we're doing in the United States, many of us are working to get different people in office so we can change the policy. Well, sunlight, um, I believe strongly is the best disinfectant. And so therefore uh, um, putting illumination on, uh, on this issue is key. Um, I know it's not your issue, but let me ask you about it. Um, you, you know, your contention is that Trump uh, wants to be the law and order president. Uh, these uh, national police uh, agency um, uh, attacks uh, or presences, I should say, not attacks, but presence in, uh, in Portland, Oregon and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe that's the same strategy to become uh, seen right before the conventions and before the election as the law and order president? I think that's a big part of it is using powers that are unnecessary to declare, I mean, look where he's going. He's going to democratic areas uh, with, with his, his um, U.S. Marshal Service and the immigration customs officers, whatever agencies he's using, and also private police. You know, that's, um, they're, they're using, you know, when, they, when, when it looked like one of these executions was going to be put off, the, the prison people actually said, you know, we can't reschedule it for a month because we have to get these contractors to come back. You know, why do they need contractors to carry out executions? But that's what they're doing. All of it is suspect. All of it. Just unbelievable. Um, quite the story. I, I wish you well in your, uh, your endeavors. Um, I hope that you can stop some of these executions. Um, I certainly do not believe in the death penalty. Never have. Don't believe in capital punishment. Um, and... Uh, this uh, 17 times more likely uh, to, uh, to get the death penalty if you kill a white person than if you kill a black person statistic that you quoted uh, is a statistic uh, that uh, the New York Times has published. Um, and they're saying that that uh, um, might actually be a way of overturning some of these uh, death penalty sentences. So I hope well, that uh, is potentially the case. What it does is it really shows that in the United States, black lives really don't matter 
and especially if you can be accused of a of a of a, of a uh, major crime of a, of a murder. So, you know, Brian, I used to support the death penalty, and what I like to tell people is, you got to do what I did, which is prove to yourself that what you believe to be the truth is actually the truth. And I say that especially when I'm speaking in schools all the time on this or any other issue. Make sure that what you think is the truth is actually the truth before you, and, and then you got to do something about it if you find that you were mistaken, and especially if you see that there's an injustice happening. So that's my invitation to you and everybody else is, you know, make make sure that, that you, you know, write a note to, to our consulate or our, the U.S. Embassy, and, and also uh, ask your politicians to bring it up when they deal with U.S. politicians. Ask businesses that uh, do business in the United States, especially in states that have the death penalty and use it to raise that when they're talking about whether or not they're going to locate in a U.S. state. You know, it's, it's, there's so many little things that people can do. And also, again, if, if, you, if you'd like to sign the petitions on our webpage at deathpenaltyaction.org or uh, even make a contribution, a little bit of money goes a long way with us. Um, we have low overhead, but we do big things. Um, and, and you're going to see that uh, at, the, at the time of these executions. Just you know, sign up on our webpage, deathpenaltyaction.org, and you'll be able to see what we're up to and help us out. Abraham Bonowitz, the director of uh, Death Penalty Action. Um, thanks for raising this issue to us. I really appreciate it. Um, of and, course. Uh, and I hope you're successful. Hey, Brian, well, that's, uh, if, if you want to have me come back and talk about where it is in a few months, be happy to do that. Thank, thank you very much. Well, that's our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as, uh, as uh, you're told, uh, um, as we just discussed, if you uh, feel strongly about this issue, you know what? Why not write a letter to uh, the U.S. president and address it to the U.S. Embassy? It's on University Avenue in Toronto. And, uh, and let's just see if we can uh, influence them. And we probably can't, but uh, at least we can try. Thank you for we joining us. We can make us. sure they know we're watching. Watching is good, too. Good night, everybody.